So um, my name is Arlene Slocum, and I am the marshal today for this Two Rivers Festivals event. Um, I'm also chair of the Two Rivers Festival Steering Committee, and uh, which is a project of the Wellington Water Watchers, um, which I've been involved with for uh, many years. And I'm uh, really impressed with the uh, the way that we've all, there's a, a group of us volunteers on the steering committee and the way we all rose to the challenge of, um, you know, these interesting times that we find ourselves in. Uh, the very day that all of the COVID closures were announced was the day that our 5,000 printed Two Rivers Festival booklets arrived on our doorstep. So the money had been spent, uh, the advertising dollars had been collected, the events had been planned. And we were just about to start distributing all of the booklets. And we knew that we needed to uh, like honor the, the advertising dollars of all these local businesses that, that um, support the project that we're doing around the festival. And so we had to get really creative really quickly. And I kudos and hats off to all of the host organizations for the way they were able to, you know, jump to the rise to the challenge and, uh, you know, and come up with a, a creative alternative of how to host all of these events in an online format, which um, for many of the organizations was a, a brand new learning curve. And I'm pleased to say that 39 out of our 40 planned events have had a, a backup plan created so that we could do them in an online format. And one of the things that, um, that I feel so proud about this festival is that all of these events are hosted by different organizations within the community and all of these organizations that are hosting an event um, you know are real community members are real community drivers and have a vested interest in the health and well-being of our rivers and do what they can to get people connected with our local rivers our theory of change at the two rivers festival is that we protect what we love and we designed this festival to host lots and lots of events to bring people to the river's edge or um, in conversation about the rivers and the health of our rivers so that we can uh, further our sense of stewardship for these precious waters that we all uh, live along and call, call home for now. Uh, so that's a little bit about the festival. Um, you'll see on, this, on the screen that I'm sharing all of the advertisers that support this event and allows us to make all of these events free to the public. So I invite you to consider, you know, having a look at all of these and, you know, supporting them once their doors are open again. These are businesses in town that are invested in our community and the health of our rivers and our waters and our, and, and our entire community, I would say. And we really appreciate their, their support and appreciate their flexibility and understanding why and how we had to shift things this year. So that's a bit about the festival and this event that we're enjoying tonight. And thank you all for taking time out of your lives to join us on a very beautiful, uh, almost summer's evening, um, to have this very important conversation. Uh, and, and hosting this conversation is uh, the Guelph Outdoor School. And I, I'm wearing a couple of hats this evening because um, Chris, my partner here, he and I, he's just inside. I'm outside and he's just inside. And um, uh, he runs the, the Guelph Outdoor School. And he's going to be hosting this event, which is uh, talking about making Guelph the most nature rich city. And so without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to you, Chris, who is the, the director of the Guelph Outdoor School. You're muted, by the way. Thanks, Arlene, just outside. She was able to just yell that over. That's <laughs> handy. Um, welcome, everybody. On behalf of Guelph Outdoor School, I'm thrilled that you could all be here. Um, for those of you who don't know, Guelph Outdoor School is uh, an alternative and a complement to the conventional classroom, offering young people a chance to get out into the woods with uh, caring and responsive mentors uh, once a week. Um, as, as a, yeah, as an alternative uh, way to grow and develop and to, to learn. Uh, and eight years in, I'm proud to be doing it. Um, and Guelph Outdoor School finds its um, effectiveness through partnerships and through, through uh, good connection throughout the community. 
Um, and so every day at the Guelph Outdoor School, we, we start in circle and we introduce ourselves and share a bit of gratitude. Um, so first off, I would love to invite anyone on the call to um, indicate their organization and their name uh, in one of two places. One spot is um, in your own little square, you know, in your own little family feud Brady Bunch Square, your Zoom Square, and the top right button, there's a, a little three dot blue button. And if you click it, you have a few options, one of which is rename. I would invite you all to uh, rename yourself to indicate the organization that you represent, if you are representing an organization. Um, and if it's just your name there, that's just fine. And if you're not, rec if you're not uh, representing an organization, you can leave it be. And if that is giving you any trouble, you can just jump right on the chat. There's a little, uh, there's a little button on the bottom screen here of your screen, which will say chat. And you can just uh, indicate that you want to send it out to everybody and just jot down your name and organization just so that we can get a feel for who's on the call here. Um, and I'll just start right up. I see Nora Challoner from the Yorkland's Green Hub. Welcome, Nora. Justina Slocum, my mother-in-law, Arlene's mom. Uh, I see, uh, I see uh, Randy. Randy from Nature Guelph. Hi, Randy. And Denise from Nature Guelph. Got Linda Starry from Yorkland's Green Hub. Uh, Sue Reitchen. I don't know if I have that name right, but welcome Sue from Guelph Urban Forest Friends. Guelph Urban Forest Friends. That's Sue. Nice to see you, Sue. Let's see. Oh, we've got Mandy from Oberg. Welcome, Mandy. We've got Tom W. from Rare. We've got Dave Beaton who might just be Dave Beaton tonight, but there we go. City of Guelph, Dave Beaton. Uh, Stan Kozak from the Gosings Foundation. Susan Ratcliffe, my high school English teacher, also representing the Architectural, Architectural Conservancy and Yorklands Green Hub and Protect Our Moraine. Um, I see Lindsay Gladding, who's an outdoor school mom. Nice to see you, Lindsay. Uh, Beth Shear from Two Rivers Festival. Lovely. Okay. Well, if I didn't name you, welcome in any case. We've got Hugh. Nice to see you, Hugh. Yeah, we've got a lot of people um, representing a number of organizations tonight. That feels good. Arlene's coming in. Um, and part of our conversation today is going to be who's not uh, here tonight and you know who might be or who could be. Um, so welcome everybody. Next on the agenda, um, at Guelph Outdoor School sometimes we say if we're not having fun we're not doing it right so we're going to have just a small pinch of fun before we get started. Um, I have prepared a poll for you. Is your thing blocked from here? Have you got oh. that little thing in that you... Hello? Someone's unmuted. I don't know if they're talking um, to me or not. I'll find out who's unmuted. And... Uh, as I was saying, we're going to do a poll. Uh, just a fun way to get warmed up. It's five questions. Don't overthink it. It is anonymous, so you can be as wonderfully honest as you like. And um, it, we're going to turn it around pretty quickly and just the poll is basically designed to give us a quick snapshot of how this group of people collectively feels about Guelph, the nature rich city, where we're at and where we could be given the right uh, effort and creative juices. So without further ado, I prepared, I prepared this, this afternoon with Arlene's help and um, here we go. Relaunch poll. There we go. Five questions, everybody. Enjoy. Don't overthink it. You're anonymous. So be honest. Okay, I'll end the poll. That's like, it's basically like an A plus. Here we go. 
Share results. Okay, everybody. I won. Attendees are now viewing poll results. That great. So no, that's great. Number one, does outdoor time feature adequately in schools and classrooms? 83% of respondents said, hell no. That's impressive. Um, question number two, we live on dish with one spoon treaty lands. Are indigenous perspectives and leadership represented adequately in decisions impacting natural spaces and our relationship to them? 13% uh, yes, indigenous people are part of the conversation. 43% said, there are some indigenous voices, but there should be, but there should be more, I guess. And no, and that's a problem. 43% said that. Notice it's a fairly leading question, actually. There could have been other options. Um, number three, on the whole, in Guelph, is access to wild space accessible to our entire Guelph community? 9% uh, said that access is uniform for all. And, 91% um, said some communities have less physical access. Um, and number four, on a scale of one to 10, where does nature connection and access to wild spaces rank in terms of overall community health and well being? With 0% zero, zero of respondents at not important, uh, we start seeing some people chiming in at six, 13% uh, at seven, 9% at eight. 26% at nine and 48%, nearly half said 10, nature connection and access to natural places is the slam dunk catch all, lowest hanging fruit and super highway towards overall community health and well being. Uh, and number five, on an average walk on a Guelph trail, how often do you see black, indigenous, or people of color? This is multiple choice. 26% um, said never thought of that. 13% uh, said almost every time. 61 said, 61% said hardly ever. So thank you all for humoring us in that. And that's a little snapshot of where we're at these days. And from here, we'll be uh, jumping in on conversations in small groups. And Arlene can tell you all about that. Mm, okay. Um, yeah, so thanks again. And I know a few more have just joined us. Uh, in the in the last little while, um, so thanks again for, for for taking time out of your evening to join this what I believe to be a really important conversation, especially in these very interesting times we find ourselves in right now. Um, when we first imagined this event, it was well before we found ourselves reeling in this pandemic, and it feels to me all the more pressing uh, that this. This, that this conversation about nature connection and being outdoors and, and increasing our health and vitality in the outdoors has, for me, risen quite a bit to the top. And then yet again, in the recent week's news, uh, so many more pieces have been um, become more prominent in that conversation too. One of those being, you know, ha I find myself often in this situation um, meeting with uh, representatives from environmental groups in town or just people who are really passionate about the environment and looking around and seeing um, in these conversations who's here and, and well done that we're here and who's not here. Like in what ways is the way that we are, um, uh, you know, sending our invites or, or speaking about it or holding a culture that is making it not as accessible to our whole community. And what are the various ways that we can do to, um, make sure that this is representative of the whole community. And by that, I mean like ev everyone who, because you know, fundamentally I believe that nature connection is a birthright and something that we all, um, you know, it's part of our DNA and our blueprint to be in connection with nature. And if, it's, if there are barriers for some folks, whether they be physical access barriers or barriers because of language and, and accessibility, not even knowing about the spaces or how to enter them, or culturally imbued barriers because of like systemic problems that we are seeing now across all of this Turtle Island. You know, it's, it's incumbent on us to have a, have a good look at those and think about what, what, what kind of questions, what kind of lists of criteria go on um, an, an effort to make a nature rich city that makes it nature rich for everyone. What are those things that go on that list that makes it inclusive and equitable 
for absolutely everyone in our community. And that's a really tall order and not something we're going to achieve in this call tonight. And this is part and the beginning of, of a long, long conversation, I hope. Um, it was a challenge that was posed to us a couple of years back when Richard Louvre, who's the author of many books and uh, the one very well-known book called Last Child in the Woods, where he coined the phrase nature deficit disorder, which, which I think many have probably heard about, heard that phrase. He's referencing particularly children um, who are growing up, increasingly growing up with less and less connection to the outdoors and the massive implications that that's having on overall health and well-being of our children. And he was here to do a keynote and to do a workshop with some other stakeholders that we had brought together in the room at that time several years ago and he threw this challenge to us. He said, consider creating a list of criteria that you all believe would make your community, your home, the most nature rich community around. Create a list of those things and make sure you're trying to get as diverse a perspective as possible and you know, challenge ourselves to, to reach those. And sometimes that, mean, that might mean, you know, uh, lobbying our representatives, our elected officials. And sometimes it might just mean banding together as, as, as people to, to come up with uh, solutions. And make this list of criteria and work towards completing the list or at least achieve, achieving some of the goals on the list. Um, and then make an award and grant ourselves an award as the most nature rich community. And I, I, I took that challenge to heart and that was several years ago and it's taken a little while for it to, to land in a way that, uh, you know, we want to actually start the conversation. And within that, I just want to point out a couple of things that the notion of a nature rich city, it, that, that's not actually um, the official title of what this needs to be. It's a, it's an idea. It's a concept that will bring a, uh, people together to talk about how do we make our community the most healthy overall uh, and, and I believe uh, having a lot of access to nature, having increasing, continually increasing the health and biodiversity of our communities and all the other implications that are, um, result in a healthy whole human being, their community aspects, many of them are social, many of them are um, spiritual, many of them are emotional physical, the whole gamut to make this thing that we all want to be and live in. And the title is not yet formed. The process is not yet formed. This is uh, just an opening and an invitation to see what are some of those things that might go on that list. In the invite, I threw out a few ideas. You know, we might set a target of, and, and quite honestly, I don't, I'm not sure what the city uh, objectives are right now around tree cover but I've heard the standard of 40% tree cover by a certain date within the community. Um, you know, all of our, of our, our, our community gardens, like meaning the uh, city gardens, being filled with uh, native pollinator plants and um, wild spaces being safe and accessible for everyone in our community. And that wild city lands are open and available for educational purposes. Um, and then tenants and treaty obligations within this dish with one spoon territory are central to all decisions and building relationships with the indigenous people and people of color in our communities. And that educators, you know, right now, I think what has come to the top of my mind is thinking about, you know, schools and how schools are going to reimagine, uh, you know, who knows what's going to happen with that process, but reimagine how more nature connection can be integrated into schools where possibly they can't go back into classrooms full of 30 children. How do we get, how do we shift curriculum to, um, to, to support children being outside in a learning environment? So those are some of the ideas that we came up with. And there are many, many, many more. And, and we wanted to hear from the members of our community. So on that, I think that I'm going to pass it back to you, Chris. Hi, Elaine. You're not going to believe this, but I don't have breakout room capabilities from my end. Okay. I don't know what to say about that. Okay. Um, so, well, I can uh, but I can. Well, that's great. Um, it sounds like the only thing we haven't covered is um, 
letting participants know that once in the breakout room, room we have one person um, basically take notes for the group. Um, there's about 10 minutes to compile all the ideas that are coming through. Um, and then that person will uh, be invited to send that list directly to you um, by email. Is that right? Yeah, so I just wanted to say this, this was a forum where we really very much wanted to hear from the community instead of us speaking. So we set the context, but we want to hear from everyone. And on a Zoom call that's uh, got a set timeline, it's not possible for us to have the time and the space to have each one of us um, have you know, a lengthy share, which is what this conversation really needs. We thought the best way to facilitate that would to be put, put everyone into small breakout rooms where, and we really would love for everyone to have a moment to share uh, thoughts, reflections on this topic. And I, I very much would like to capture this um, to be able to proceed going forward. So I'm wondering if I'm, it's randomly, I'm randomly gonna put you in breakout rooms. And I'm wondering within your room, if one of you could agree to take some quick notes in an, in a, just on the side, doesn't have to be on the Zoom platform, just take some notes that you'd be willing to email to me later. And I'm gonna pop my email address in the chat and I'll also email it to you all after so that you can reply to me. And I'm wondering if one person in each group would be willing to do, to be sort of a, you know, just take a, a brief notes and also to make sure that everybody in the group has a moment to share. What would you uh, think is an important thing to put on a list if we were to imagine ourselves the most nature rich city what would be a criteria or multiple criteria to be on that list from your point of view? Like, what would you like to see? So pollinate um, plants everywhere or whatever, you know, however that lands for you. Yeah. Um, I just joined uh, the board of directors for Yorkland's Green Hub. Yeah. So yeah. you're trying to, and are you familiar with the project? Yes. Yes. That would probably be the big sort of in my mind. I think it's, I'm still trying to catch up on all the information. It's all very new, but I think it's one of the largest um, pieces of land still available at the, um, in our area. So to be yeah. able to keep it as wetlands and have people be able to use it would be. Yeah. Okay. Example. Excellent. All right. I just am going to welcome Elise here. Hi, Elise. I'm, I'm going to unmute you here. And, and maybe just catch up on, on what's going on here. We um, have all the participants are currently in little breakout rooms discussing uh, what would be on their list of criteria to make the most nature rich city. So you've jumped into our room. So my name's Arlene, I'm facilitating the event and we've got Hillary here who's recently um, joined the board of Yorkland's Green Hub. And you know, many of us are also, you know, whether or not we're representing an organization, we're just passionate individuals about the health of our city. So right now we're just having a little conversation about what would make, what we think would make the city the most nature rich. And yeah, I hear you, Hillary, you're talking about Yorkland's Green Hub becoming a, a reality and protecting those wetlands and keeping them accessible for folks. Do you wanna add anything more to that? Um, just going back to that diversity piece, I think, you know, obviously in environmental education, the goal is to get kids and youth and, and everyone out there learning about nature and a lot of the ways we plan on doing that is in connection with schools and different programs connected to schools, but I would also like to see us connect with, there are so many organizations in the city that don't have like wouldn't necessarily be top of mind if you're thinking of like environmental education. I think everyone kind of thinks kids, mm -hmm. but we could partner with um, with immigrant services, uh, Black Heritage Society, even artistic groups, mental health groups. Um, yeah. Is there the um, and the name is escaping me, but any like disability uh, groups and just kind of make sure that everyone you know, take it upon ourselves to make sure that we go out to these communities as opposed to hoping that they go out of their way to find us. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. There's something that I find that the environmental movement has not, like there's wonderful things that are happening in the movement, but 
I think that there is there's a piece missing in that outreach piece, and I'm I'm glad to see that a lot more effort and focus is is going that way because it's really not nature connection unless it is for our whole community. I believe anyway. So mm -hmm. yeah. It looks like we are all back, and I hope uh, I hope that went smoothly. Many of us are taking this big, fast, wild learning curve on Zoom, and uh, you just never know. But hopefully, that that worked. Um, I have put my email address into the chat, and for anyone um, who's able to, I would very, very much love to capture any notes that were taken or thoughts that were shared or anything that you would like to share after you know through this meeting or beyond after i'd love to hear that relates to this topic i'd very much love to hear it and i hope you all had a chance to to speak a little bit and share and i think chris are we going to catch like a big high level overview of what happened i would love to yeah maybe the maybe we could just designate the person who took an, uh the notes um maybe we could just have each person just share the one the one thing that really stuck out in something like 20 or 30 seconds how many how many breakout rooms were there arlene uh there were seven rooms oh, okay so that should be fine eh? that's like a four minute oh yeah that's great oh four it's fine we got okay. time. yeah we have time okay great um well if you're one of those people who would love to uh yeah share on what your group came up with and really like the thing that stuck out the thing that stuck out what you dwelled upon, what was really exciting. Um, feel free to uh, unmute yourself, or if you can't, you know, raise your hand or um, you know, indicate that you're uh, ready to offer something. We've got Rachel White over here. We can unmute you. Hi, Rachel. Hi. What stuck out? Man, it's going to be hard, just limited to one thing, but I think that uh, much of our conversation was central around uh the education system so the different metrics we were thinking about that were um time that students were spent like that spent oh, sorry time students spent in nature and that could be qualified in many different ways um considering a criteria about um how natural schoolyards are and working towards a certain threshold for uh natural spaces on schoolyards and then um, part of that discussion centered around um, those natural spaces, including uh, like pollinator gardens and um, other species that might have cultural significance to the indigenous peoples in the area. So other learning opportunities related to naturalizing schoolyards. Mm. Thank you, Rachel. You're welcome. That's great. Uh, let's see who else got a hand up. We, we got Denise Fell from Nature Guelph. I'm going to unmute you or ask to unmute you anyway. There you go. Hi, Denise. Hi there. Hi there. How are you? This is fun. Um, yeah. So, group three um, had quite a good discussion. Um, there were kind of four key points that we brought up. The first was the idea of cultural barriers and that we can't necessarily expect all different cultural groups and communities to even necessarily. Uh, know about the concept of being connected to nature and even necessarily uh, have a desire to do that. Um, so what we need to do is, is to, to learn more about different cultures and communities, find the ones that are maybe disconnected just um, as a part of their own culture um, or where they come from, um, and, and then try to figure out how we can connect them, how to engage them, how to find them and bring them in. So it's not enough just to create opportunities for them, we have to actually bring them in somehow. Right. Uh, the other idea we thought was just economics in general. If you don't have a, uh, a living wage and if you're not comfortable uh, that you're secure and, and you can't start thinking about going out and trying to find nature necessarily. Um, we talked about transportation and access being an issue, especially in the city of Guelph, where there are some subdivisions that aren't even walkable. Um, and in general, you really can't get to a natural area without drop someone driving you in a car. Um, and it's just, it's very difficult. And then um, we heard from Hugh about in the, in the UK, I believe it was the UK, right Hugh, where there's a green bus. And if you take the, uh, the public transit of the cities out to the edge of the countryside, you can now take the green bus system and it will tell you where the different places on the countryside access. It'll take you to a stop, you get out, it talks about where to go through the countryside, you get to the next stop, take the bus back. 
it sounds amazing. We sure don't have that here. I mean, there's the park bus to Algonquin and that, but it, that's not the same concept, right? That's just takes it so much further. And lastly, um, building on that idea of schoolyards, definitely not being nature friendly at all. And I must say that my kids went to Victory and there's, it's, a, it's a complete cement playground, right? And I tried to help green that playground. I really tried. Nobody was willing to do anything to really change that school ground. It was completely just not happening, but they're not even allowed to go to the park across the road. Um, except maybe once a year for track and field. It's right across the road. They're not even allowed to go there, even for gym. But the idea is that we need to have a more intentional, improved outdoor and nature education program in our systems to connect kids. It's, there's a couple of teachers in some schools that will take the kids to a nearby uh, natural area if they can, but most schools, the kids have really no connection at all to nature. They don't really learn much about nature. Um, they're not taking advantage of opportunities even to like watch birds at bird feeders. They're not, they're just not really, they're not taking advantage and they're not teaching kids about nature. Thank you, Denise. I wrote it all down. I love it. Let's see, are there any other hands going up right here? Yeah, Lynn Basari from York Lands. Did I see Hi. that hand go up? I yeah. think we were group six and um, um, Mandy from Oak Park had some really great ideas. Um, she was, um, she's in Ottawa apparently, and she's just um, noticing that in, in Guelph, um, we don't really have a lot of um, naturalized transit, like ways to get around by bike or walking um, to get from place to place through the natural areas. Like whereas in Ottawa, there's lots of, trails through the city that you can go from place to place it's, it's, if you don't want to take the bus or get in the car um, so i don't know creating more some um, trails that, that connect to different parts of the city um, and then um, renaturalizing some of the parks like for instance in the willow road area there's not a lot of there, there's parkland but it's it's not naturalized it's like a playground and a, a baseball field or, or whatever um, so maybe taking portions of those parks to naturalize them um, and you know create more accessibility in sort of those local areas local neighborhoods um, and then maybe trying to work on changing policies at the city's municipal level um, in terms of um, you know when a development comes in they are allowed to give money in lieu of providing park parkland um, or green space. And um, I think quite often the developer pays that extra money instead of building the making sure there's green space nearby. Um, so, you know, working towards changing those um, bylaws. I know that's very difficult, but um, that's something that we talked about as well. Oh, and then green roofs. Um, like when a new building is built, have, making sure there's a green roof on top. So that's what we talked about. Okay, thank you, Lynn. I love it. I've written it all down, but there will also be a chance to email things out. I'm just noticing there are a number of these Zoom squares that are, are uh, I can't see a face on them. So, you know, if you're one of those people representing a group and you can't raise your hand visibly, um, feel free to unmute yourself and say over here, over here, or something like that. Um, I'm not seeing anyone. So in the meantime, oh, here we go. We've got John from Nature Golf here. We can unmute you. Hi, John. Sarah from Rare maybe goes first. Sarah, do you want to go first? <laughs> I can't hear you. Look, now you can hear you. Yeah. Thanks, John. Hi, Sarah. Uh, hi. Uh, so I, uh, I was talking with Susan Ratcliffe and Stan Kozak, and um, we were looking at it very much from a um, being stewards of natural areas kind of perspective and, and talking about a fairly large problem facing a lot of natural areas right now with the COVID-19 um, stuff going on and that there's a lot of people outside enjoying nature, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a lot of kids playing along the river and hiking in forests and biking. Um, people are trying to get out a lot more. And it seems like there's a lot of people trying to find uh, real nature, like forests and rivers, as opposed to just hanging out in the parks, um, which is encouraging on the one hand, but um, it's also a difficult situation for a lot of, um, for the city and for 
um, land trust owners because it's um, there's not enough nature to go around and it's resulting in a lot of severe degradation of the natural areas that people are wanting to be out in. Um, things like campfires and off trail creations, bike jumps, which um, is an issue in a lot of urban natural areas right now. So we were discussing um, what possible solutions could be out there, whether it's the fact that people are just not understanding, uh, maybe they don't know what habitat is being destroyed. Um, maybe uh, there needs to be signage or education, or maybe there just needs to be more natural areas, some that are higher prioritized than others. Um, some that are publicly accessible and some that aren't. Um, but I think that it's something that really needs to be talked about, especially these days, because there has been just like such a higher pressure on a lot of our natural areas in urban places like Guelph. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Yeah, Sarah, it really seems to point to a, like a cultural thing, right? Such that when people go out to natural spaces, they, they, uh, they just have it sort of worked into them from a young age, you know, how, how to be and how not to be. Um, yeah, that sounds like a nice long-term plan to be working away on. Thank you. Um, John, you graciously uh, pointed to Sarah, but now we want to hear you. Okay, th thank you. It's hard to uh, capture um, a 10 minute meeting um, where, where we're just sort of getting going and then we stopped. Um, I think two two people in our, our group of four were new to Guelph, and they said, "Well, why why are there so many nature groups in Guelph? What's the difference between your clan hub and nature Guelph? You know, I don't, don't get it. I don't understand the relationships." Um, two, there are two teachers. One one a retired teacher, or maybe two retired teachers and, a, and a, an active uh, teacher, and they they said, "We're well, getting kids into nature is really important." But actually, there's also there may be there are many barriers, all sorts of different. Uh, barriers to do, doing that, including parents not necessarily wanting them to, to go into nature. Um, a couple of people talked about indigenous groups and, and more involvement with, uh, with uh, local indigenous groups in terms of relationship uh, to the land. And um, others talked about collaboration between the different nature groups in Guelph, trying, trying to, I mean, it's, there's a huge number of ideas obviously floating around here now, but we need to, uh, collaborate more because we could probably do a lot more together than we can uh, we can do alone so that that's i hope um captured some of the conversation okay. thank you john yeah i appreciate that it's almost like we need someone whose full-time job it is to keep us you know talking to each other it's easy to sort of stay in our lane but wouldn't it be wonderful if there was more of more of this um okay okay um well i was one of those people so i will just chime in and say that um i i spoke with um nora from your clans and randy from nature wealth and dave beaton who does parks and trails with the city and our conversation centered around uh accessible mapping you know you can be walking just down the middle down mcdonnell street for example and find a nice glossy accessible fun map which can lay out you know what the story of the day what what you could be doing that weekend or really just helping people to understand what's waiting for them just outside city limits or you know parks that they've never heard of um, the york lands green hub when that comes to be uh, and, and dave helped us understand some of the limitations to that but there's probably a lot that could be done in terms of you know extending beyond like topographic maps and GIS maps that are available to people only when they look and have things that are you know, right, right out uh, in the in public view uh, to inspire people to go find those natural places um, in and around Guelph. So that's that was where we centered. We also talked about a shuttle to get that little green bus to get people out. But that's where we uh, that's where we stayed. Um, just taking a quick look to see if there's anyone else. Uh, I could I could jump in too because although I was I was busy putting you all in rooms, I ended up with a few folks <laughs> who were just joining, and I we ended up in a room on our own as well. So I was with both um, Elise and Hillary from Your Clan's Green Hub, and y you know the vision of that place um, is is sort of like a big vision for 
providing you know a place where people can come and explore and be in connection with nature as well as an education center as well as concerted outreach to the various members and communities and populations within this city uh, understanding that there needs to be intentional outreach to as possibly as Denise was saying earlier too there needs to be a lot of learning about the various communities um, to see about like cultural uh, approaches to to nature and what it means in terms of those community populations and then you know working to 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 bridge the the difference there and um let me see what else uh, oh i one thing that i wanted to share in addition oh i a couple of things prior to this event so maybe if i don't know if there's somebody else that's going to share but i'll just jump these two things in as well prior to this event i had asked if anybody had you know, couldn't attend the event, but wanted to have some things identified. And one of the groups that I spoke with was um, some contacts and some friends at Immigration Services. And uh, they are, have been very busy and overwhelmed in this time, as many um, service organizations have, um, but definitely are wanting to find and have materials that, that possibly even could be translated into other languages to service the community that of new Canadians that come into this, city and might want to learn more about what's going on in our city. So they offer a service of translation and that could be something that many um, nature-based organizations could could do with their materials. And also they do an awful lot of training on uh, cultural sensitivity awareness and, and ways of um, building equity in our own leadership in our own organizations to make sure that the people we're all trying to invite in are, they see themselves within our communities. And so there's a lot of good and big work happening that way. Um, another bit of input from that I heard from several people was, you know, if we really are going to have some kind of metric about increasing the, the health of, of nature in this city, um, it would be really important to have some baseline data. So citizen science type gathering of data that can help us point or understand if we are managing to increase the health of, of our city, that there are many, many programs like that that could be implemented here in this community as a way of both gathering data and connecting people with nature. So bird sits or bird counts or, you know, um, bio blitzes and fun things like that that could be done. Thanks, Arlene. Got some kids making some, hey girls. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see here. We've got Ron and Lynn. Lynn is ready to say something. Lynn, could we hear from you? Um, yeah, I was in a group with Tom from Rare, um, Sue Wrighton from Guff, and Ronnie's from the Council of Canadians. We started from tree coverage, basically, saying that 40% um, was actually not enough and that we needed to be do more than that and sue talked about the huge problem of <clears throat> trying to put trees into new areas in guelph where where it's just not designed i mean all sorts of things the soil and all kinds of other stuff and that we came to the conclusion that the city is just too slow to do this stuff and that we need to kind of encourage them to do things with uh, individual stewardship so that you know just putting one tree and getting a tax break on your <coughs> on your on your new lawn if you can actually keep it alive rather than waiting for the city to do it and those with more land being encouraged to actually not just mow lawns but to actually have trees and other things Tom gave us a lot of information on this he said that <clears throat> that if you know we could begin to think about using these great swaths of, of grass that we have in our cities, uh, naturalize them um, at, because they're carbon sequestering, and that it would be absolutely great. And they're great for insects, and they're great for birds. And that we need a, to find a way that that big corporations don't get freaked out and think they're going to be sued because somebody might be stung by a bee if they actually walk through it. That kind of stuff. So we had a long conversation about that kind of stuff um <clears throat> so we want it to make it too expensive to have 15 acres of grass in the city we think that if you could sequester it would be great and then we began a conversation about the guelph um 
Correctional Centre, which actually it will be the home of your clan screen hub and talked about how important it is to keep land that is currently in <coughs> owned by the public and it is owned by us we own it guys you know the province stewards for us but it's our land keeping it public because it's already there and not covering it with developments and all sorts of other really dumb stuff so we started that conversation but didn't go any further than that because then you asked us to come back but it was great thank you Thank you, Lynn. I love it. It is important to limit dumb stuff, and I appreciate that, uh, Sorry, that closing yes. remark. It's great. Uh, let's see here. We have a great comment uh, from Elise in the chat. Uh, it reads, could Guelph create a, quote, adopt a green space program that offered participatory opportunities for restoration, naturalization, and stewardship so people could care for spaces they wish to use? It might also be interesting to create school gardening workshops, York Lands, or other groups to get people involved in learning how to naturalize school grounds, plant more biodiversity, pollinator spaces, etc. Great job. That would be a great job for York Lands Green Hub, that's for sure. And great to have examples. You know, great for people, great to show people uh, you know, what, what could be done in their own in their own schools. Thank you for that. I see that Anne Monroe uh, has a hand up there, Chris. Okay, great. Um, Whoops. <laughs> hello, Anne. Um, I just had a comment. I, I heard last week that I believe the city has a target of 13 areas that they want to be uh, pollinator gardens, and they're up to four. So it's, uh, and they will supply plants and things apparently this is something to check out but um uh fridays for future is working on a bit of property that they've discovered that they want to uh reclaim uh so it might be worth checking out uh what, how how much the city is willing to support that kind of project or those kinds of projects Thank you, Anne. I wonder if Dave, because uh, I see a, a message from him yeah. in the chat, might have anything he would like to share on, on that from, from a city point of view. Dave Beaton. Yes, uh, we have a, it's exciting to hear people that are excited about projects that I've been trying to get off the ground. Um, and we have some great examples of community-based sewers um, groups uh, like the Wolf on Park group uh, that has been doing some fantastic work for a number of years. Um, and we were growing uh, a lot of native pollinators, native plants that we were to plant out. Uh, and then COVID uh, came up and bit us in the butt and caused some issues, but we got those out to a lot of the community gardens. So we have a number of plants that have gone out to community gardens and to a number of other spots. But in a post COVID world, um, we are looking to be uh, supporting, um, supporting community tree plantings. We're looking to be supporting community uh, stewardship of a responsible stewardship of natural areas to get people involved in, be it dealing with invasive species, be it um, making making our natural areas a bit more sustainable. Um, that is something that we have been doing, and we have hosted a great meeting with the, with Guff uh, early in the year, um, January or February, and unfortunately, it's a lot of the progress has uh, taken a back seat this year because of 85% um, cut to our staffing levels um, at the moment. So uh, stay tuned and stay interested because it is something that we would like to do. And we recently hired uh, a staff member that is, that is their role is to be helping us facilitate um, uh, coming up with good plans to be able to do good things in our natural areas. Sorry, a little rambly. Great, thanks Dave. 
Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, has struck me in this conversation and in, in lead up conversations to this is that uh, there are no shortages of really great ideas and probably really great initiatives and even activities and tree plantings or pollinator plantings and the things that are going on in our community. And maybe one of, one of the criteria is that we all learn how to connect more so that we can all like learn and share about these, these things. And um, in an earlier meeting that I'd had with uh, Judy from Nature Guelph and Martin Tamlin from the Old Growth Forest, when we were just sort of brainstorming this idea some months back, uh, was, you know, wouldn't that be great if the environmental orgs had a like a common place to share events and activities that were going on? And we were kind of dreaming up what that could be like. But in subsequent conversations, uh, I've had, uh, we were in one with Rachel this week, we were talking about, you know, there is this really great, um, I don't know if it's a Facebook page, exactly what it is, but it's Guelph Happenings. And it talks about all sorts of cultural events happening in Guelph. And, you know, there aren't, I don't believe there aren't a lot of environmental initiatives on that Guelph Happenings place. They might be artistic or social or uh, creative in those kinds of ways. But, you know, there, there's already a forum that a lot of people go to. And I wonder if Guelph Happenings is something that all of us could use as a portal to share things that are going on in our community that we want to attract a broader representation to. Um, so that's one idea, but also just, you know, how do we, um, I, I don't, if I, I have some other remarks that I'd, I'd like to, to say, but only if we've kind of wrapped this part. So maybe before I do that is, are there, you know, we want to be aware of everybody's timing too and not keep everybody for forever on a beautiful sunny evening. Oh, Denise, you have something else to share. If you don't mind, I was just thinking about how we're talking a lot about how we want to increase the ability and desire of people to access and connect with nature. And we want to uh, also talk about, uh, we've heard a little bit about increasing the health of nature in the city. Um, I really feel like we need to talk a bit more about what are the repercussions about having more people get into natural areas and putting a lot of pressure on them. We've heard from a few people here about that, you know, especially um, uh, with respect to some of the issues at Rare and the city of Guelph. Um, people getting into nature uh, don't necessarily uh, protect it. They, and so we need to think about if we're going to have people get into nature and be wanting to be in it more, what are we going to do then to balance it out? What mechanisms are going to have to protect it? Certainly right now with COVID, we're seeing a lot more people having an interest in emergency preparedness and in self-sufficiency. Um, I'm concerned about more people getting out foraging and taking materials to bring home to cook with. I'm worried about people getting out into nature and digging up plants to bring to their gardens. We've heard a bit about you know, um, possibly um, increasing man-made trails and damaging and trampling, um, leaving your garbage behind, dumping things. So I'm, I'm thinking we also need to think about that as well. If we're going to encourage nature use to talk about how to protect it, uh, we're going to have management, monitoring, education. I like the adopt a green space idea. So that's something else that I think I, I didn't really think about before, but that's probably a really important piece of this. Yeah, and I, I just might like to share again, too, that, um, yeah, I really appreciate it. And this is where, you know, in order to really increase the health and diversity of nature, we, we, we end up, you know, in conversation with other humans and hu human, humans and working with other humans can, can be wonderful and interesting and fun and exciting and can also be really challenging because there's lots of different points of view and and it's just going to take lots of conversations and um, what one of which is there's a lot of different perspectives on like the ethics of care for natural spaces you know there's a lot of differing views including you know even if we were to invite different people from from different um you know visible communities too they might be very many different views on how that happens. And I think that if we start, you know, if we are educating our young people from a very early age about the importance of a natural environment and, and, and building in an ethic of stewardship in those spaces, then there's, there's, then there's no problem with humans in nature. You know, it's, 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 we, we are, we are intertwined with it and probably could, and probably have for the bulk of our existence lived in fairly relative harmony 
with the natural world. The problem is right now we don't have an ethic of stewardship. We have an ethic of take or uh, so. So working with our young people, it seems so, you know, that's the work that we do at the Guelph Outdoor School. And I know so many of you do. And uh, it, it seems to me that that's like ground zero. Start with uh, um, our, our young folks and d developing the ethics of stewardship as just a part of being human in this community. And then we can expand our wild spaces and know it's all going to be looked after and taken care of in an ideal world. Arlene? It's yeah, Nora. Nora. It's yeah. Nora. Could I say, and I don't, I, I, I cut out for about 10 minutes. I didn't, I don't know what happened, but something froze and now I'm back. So mm -hmm. if I'm repeating myself, just stop me. But at the moment, your clans has a program we invite people to take part in. It's called the Yorkies Little Discoveries Challenge. And families with their children are invited to go out and to find a spot there. They're given a little hint because we use our mascot to set them in that spot. Um, but it's a weekly challenge. It is funded by um, one of the businesses in the East End um, as part of Noticing Nature programming. So I urge any of these groups to actually connect with it on our website or on Facebook. Every week on Facebook, you get a new challenge. And there are significant, um, there are $40 gift certificates for um, as a draw at the end of June. We're halfway through this program, but not enough people know about it. It's a wonderful program, and the ones who have won already are absolutely thrilled. So we are, um, we're wanting more families to know about it, you know, and, and it's a very easy place to have social distancing from other groups out there. Or, or young people can go on their own. Anybody can go. A single person could go and take part in the Yorkies Little Challenges. So check out the website and, um, and let your friends know because these gift certificates are there and it's a shame if they're not being used. <laughs> and the gift certificates are actually for nature products from three particular designated stores. One is the bookshelf, one is Wyndham Arts, and the other is the Wild Birds Unlimited. So each of those stores has wonderful things to inspire families and children and all ages to identify species, connect more with stewardship and protection and, and enjoyment of the outdoors. Could I make one more point before I move on, Arlene? I was thinking about the point you made about how we used to connect with nature without any problems. We used to be more connected and everything was okay. I was thinking that there's a lot more people now than there were, you know, even 50 years ago and a lot more people in urban areas with a lot of pressure on the nearby natural areas. And I think as a naturalist and a wildlife biologist, I'm very cognizant that we need to leave some space for nature and for wild animals to be because they can't handle a lot of human pressure and a lot of species will not be able to survive in areas where there are a lot of people interacting in their, in their spaces. Um, they're bringing in dogs for walking, they're taking them off leash, they're, they, you know, they're, they're making a lot of noise um, and there's actually more conflict with some of the wild animals that need that space like coyotes which have every right to be here and always have been here but the more we interact with them the more we put them in peril and those animals actually often are, are put down if they're, they're thought to be a, a risk to us. So I think we do need to understand that around Guelph, we're going to have to leave some spaces. And I'm hearing a lot of conversations with COVID of people saying, we have the right to get our natural areas. We should be given more access to more natural areas. I think we need to be aware that we do need to save some space for nature to be able to survive with, uh, without human interaction. So we can't let every natural area be uh, accessed by people all the time. Yeah, agreed, agreed, for sure, Denise, yeah. Thanks, Denise, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, well, I like, I like what you're offering there, Denise, because it assumes that our scheme of, you know, of, of creating a nature-rich city and making, um, allowing the entire city of Guelph uh, greater opportunities, you know, layer upon layer to, to find their way out into, uh, you know, outdoor adventures and all the good things that happen with it. Um, if, if it does work, if we pull this off over, over coming weeks and months, uh, we will need to have vigilance of, of that kind. And it'll be great to have voices that uh, you know, work to keep us in check and make sure that, that we're not uh, you know, going, going too far with it or whatever it is. Um, and I'd be glad if we had to have that kind of voice because it means that uh, you know, it's working. Um, Arlene, you and I spoke about um, 
finding a way to amalgamate all this and take in all the uh, notes that people will be sending in. And we talked about getting uh, notes out to people uh, afterwards. If anyone would not like to be contacted um, with, with uh, next steps uh, based on these, this con these conversations tonight, uh, please just drop us a line. Uh, otherwise, we'll be sending you um, a note about you know, how to go forward um, with, uh, with next steps, you know, how to put some of these great ideas uh, and perspectives into action. Um, so either put that into the chat right now or email um, Arlene directly with the, um, with the address that she posted, uh, arlene.slocum at gmail.com. Um, and I want to, I, on behalf of Guelph Outdoor School, uh, thank, so, thank you all for coming out. Uh, we often say that um, providing nature connection to kids um, doesn't go very far without engaging a conversation with the adults. You know, it still is us uh, who they look up to. So um, with that, I'll pass it back to Arlene. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, and I also just wanted to be really clear that we we don't, you know, we meaning like Chris and I at this moment uh, don't don't have um, like steps planned out going forward. This is a, an emergent and an organically growing conversation, just one that we wanted to have started. And so, in those emails, if you're going to be willing to send me an email, if you're interested in being more involved in shaping what this could look like, what it might be called, what steps might be the next steps um, and you know we can we can engage each one at the at the ability to commit that you have to offer you know I know probably everyone here is a is relatively busy person to some degree and have busy lives and so it, the intention is not to you know take over your lives and and but we could we could each commit to whatever we could if you wanted to be part of shaping what this could look like going forward or even if you just have ideas on what some next steps were it truly is um I, like what i can imagine a fully democratic process being it's not there is no leadership other than we are just the ones that have have started to try to have the conversation so it really can take whatever form we all feel is necessary and for the next step i'll compile feedback and send out send that out and welcome possibly a steering committee to form or something of that nature. And I, I guess I just really wanted to, to close with the thoughts. Like I find, um, you know, before, prior to COVID, um, both our family and uh, through the outdoor school, we had um, ordered a bunch of painted lady caterpillars to hatch um, over this, over this springtime. And, wouldn't you know it, we found ourselves like wrapped up in COVID when they arrived. So we've had all of those little um, caterpillars growing and forming in their chrysalis and shifting into their, their butterfly forms here in our home as we've been able to watch the whole process. And, uh, you know, painted ladies are a native pollinator here. Um, and, and beautifully today, I was able to release many of them and, and my kids watched and uh, we were on a online version with outdoor school and they were watching and it was just beautiful. But I have been struck with the metaphor um, of that process um, and feeling that, you know, we're all in these really, really bizarre times where we're finding, you know, somebody, I think this, there was a meme going around that, you know, one of the, the impacts of this time right now of being in isolation is a bit akin to mother nature telling us to go to our rooms and think about what we've done. And it feels like I've had a lot of time to think about where we're at. Hopefully we've all had some time. And I, not, I know time is a privilege that I've had and not, not everybody, frontline workers are not having the kind of time that I've had. But I, I was imagining ourselves as, um, you know, as those little caterpillars. Oh, Chris is sharing a bit here. And watching, watching that form and, you know, anybody who's looked into the process a bit, it's just so, so fascinating. You know, the caterpillars are munching and, and what they need to eat and growing and um, embedded in their bodies are these like imaginal cells that when they go to turn into their chrysalises, they form into their chrysalises and they turn into this goop, this soupy mess into, in their little shell. And the imaginal cells are the piece that has the, the, the print, the blueprint for the butterfly that will emerge and it was existing in the caterpillar. 
And the metaphor has been really rich with me in this time right now about, you know, we're in our rooms thinking about what we've done and we have this potential to come out in, in a different way and, and possibly live more deeply into the blueprint that, that I believe is in us. And from my perspective and, and possibly some of you share in this because you're on this call that con connection deeper, more meaningful connection to nature is, is, is embedded in that blueprint. And I think the times are, 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 are rich right now for us to imagine and, you know, and be bold and to really start to, to, to take back or maybe back, maybe um, reclaim might be the word, our, our, our birthright, which is connection to nature. And that that's the birthright of every child in our community too. And find the ways that we can just, you know, leverage this time to come out on the other side, making life better for all of us and in all of the many ways that we do. But I have loved this as a metaphor and they're beautiful, those creatures right there. I'm glad, Chris, you had that footage and you could show that. It's so lovely. So I know we have not, you know, this is the tip of the iceberg that we've just started talking and I know 10 minutes is nowhere near enough to have this conversation. This is the beginning of conversations. I'd love to invite any of you to further deeper conversations and any ideas y'all have on how that could go, I'm, I'm all ears. So please email me. And once again, I'm gonna thank you for taking time out of your day to join this conversation. And if you, I, I hope and trust that everyone had a moment to have their voice heard. And if that's not the case, our apologies, that was our intention in this event. Um, but please do reach out if you would, if you have something special to share because all of our voices are, are essential in this conversation. And with that, um, there's no further ado, I'm going to bid us all good night. <laughs>